theme for this series, Bring Someone With You, has been 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and those two verses, uh, 22 and 23, from the Living Bible. It's up on the screen. It's in your outline. Let's look at it together. Whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. I do this to get the gospel to them. And also for the blessing I myself receive when I see them come to Christ. Wow. Isn't that an awesome word? Friends, if you've never led anybody to Jesus, let me just tell you, you have no idea the joy that it is when you give somebody Jesus. Now, you may have had the joy of seeing your kids or a loved one or a friend open a gift that you've given them. But there is no comparison to the joy that comes when we share Jesus Christ with people. And that's what this series is all about, bringing someone with you, giving people Jesus. Now, last Sunday, Pastor Wayne kicked off this series by presenting this intentional plan of how to bring hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, to our friends and to our family. Now, if you remember, he talked about identify. Right over here um, on our left, you see the banner, identify, and Pastor challenged us to identify Four, say four. Four people who um, are, live in our influence, where we work, where we play, and where we live. And so he challenged us to identify four people, four names, and to really focus on them. In fact, um, along with that, you see these crosses up here with all the names on them. The folks that were here last Sunday, they filled out four cards with four names on them, and we came forward and secured them to the cross. So if you weren't with us last Sunday, I want to challenge you during our service today as the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you identify four people in your realm of influence, write their names down at the end of the service. There's cards up here at the foot of the cross. Um, Write their names down, secure them to the cross with the tax that are available, and people are going to be praying for these names. Um, up through Easter, all right? So identify four people. Also, there's a space on the back of your outline today where you can write down the names of those four people that are in those three areas of your influence, put it in your Bible, pray all week long, really, really, really begin to call out to God on behalf of those four people that you've identified, right? Now, the second step is to intercede. Intercession has to do with praying and really calling out to God um, on behalf of those four people. And so I want to challenge you as you write those names down, as we put them on the cross, to begin to intercede. Now, we're going to talk more about that today, so that's all I'm going to say right now. The third area is investing. We want you to find really intentional ways of expressing acts of kindness to those four individuals. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor Tim, I do not have time to do anything else for anybody. I got enough going on with me. I wanna challenge you. During these next few weeks, put your agenda aside and let's put God's agenda as our number one priority and let's begin really to focus on other people and put their needs before your own. Now listen, you're really gonna have to pray about this because what you think would speak to someone might not be the thing that they need for you to do. Are you with me? How many of you, um, your spouse has a different love language than you do? You know? I mean, I'm all about words of affirmation. You know, somebody tells me I love them and whoo! Or that they love me, whoo! You know, but I say that to my wife and she says, hey, what have you done for me lately? (laughs) She's all about those acts of kindness, you know, she's all about those. And so um, that's what investing is, doing acts of kindness uh, for those that we're really praying for and focusing on those four people. And then the fourth one is invite. Listen to me. Um, You heard today about um, our Easter weekend that's coming up in just a few weeks. Um, We're doing that vertical uh, message, the impossible climb. Listen to me, people go to church on Easter. They just do. They can go somewhere and get, you know, three hymns and a poem, or they can come to grace and they can hear about Jesus that will change their life forever. So we need to invite them and make sure that our family and our friends are at grace on Easter weekend so that they can hear that gospel presentation, amen, and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I want to challenge you in these next several weeks, let's really go to work. Now, Easter at Grace is an entire church event. It's not just about the preacher or the people who are helping us with dramas or anything like that. So I want to invite you to take out this insert that was in your bulletin today. Um, You'll notice the the graphic there. Check out that graphic. David Jones, our own David Jones, made that graphic for this sermon. Isn't that awesome? 
Really cool stuff. Vertical, the impossible climb. That's going to be the Easter weekend theme here at Grace. Now, on the back of that insert, there is an opportunity for you to connect in helping serve the Lord and serve one another um, during the Easter weekend here at Grace. So I want to challenge you. Listen, it's time to get off the couch and get in the game, right? It's time to to be a field player. Uh, Get off the bench and get into the game. And this is your opportunity. Um, God has given you gifts, he's given you strengths to use for the kingdom of God. So I wanna challenge you, fill out that information, mark an area where you can help, and on your way out today, you can drop it in one of the offering receptacles at any of the doors uh, here, get it to an usher, whatever you need to do, but turn that in today, and we'll make sure that you get connected with the right team to help serve the body of Christ here at Grace and all of our guests on Easter weekend. So help us with vertical, the impossible climb. You're filling that out now. I see some of you with writing utensils. The rest of you will have an altar call here at the end of the service. You can ask Jesus to forgive you. (laughs) Amen. All right, so as you can see, this series really outlines a very practical operation to reach those around us with the love of Jesus Christ, Amen? amen? However, we still, if we're not careful, will skip over the spiritual operation that is also included and must not be overlooked in this process. So today, we wanna bring our focus into that second area in bringing someone with you, that area of intercession, or the praying part of bringing someone with you. So the first thing I want us to look at today is the importance of prayer or why we intercede, why we intercede, why intercession, why is that so important? What is the importance of prayer? Well, I'm really glad you asked. In John chapter six, verse number 44, in this passage of scripture, I want you to look at it there in your outline or on the screen. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Look at the first three words of that passage of scripture. No one can. I want you to underline that, circle that on your, in your outline. Very important, three very important words. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. These are the words of Jesus Christ, and can I tell you today that the transformation of salvation is initiated by God the Father. Do you see it? Jesus says no one can come to himself, no one can come to Jesus unless God enables them, unless God draws them. So I want to dare you today that we would begin to call out to God and ask him to draw people to salvation. You see, God draws people out from a life of compromise, out of confusion, out of judgment, to a life of holiness, to a life of joy, and to a life of forgiveness. Amen? If you've tasted that, say amen. Amen. When we commit to be a follower of Jesus Christ, God calls us out of darkness into his awesome light. It is an incredible experience. The Bible says no one can come to Jesus any other way. So we must pray to God that he would draw our friends and our family to Jesus. Why intercede? Because it's a God action. It's a spiritual operation. And when we pray, we engage the God of salvation in the process of salvation. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's look at this second scripture. It's there in your outline. It's from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, verse three. Look at the first three words in this passage. It says, no one can. Say that Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. I want you to underline those first three words. Circle them in that passage of scripture. No one can say that Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Listen, church, it's when we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we are saved. Isn't that what scripture says? So we need the Holy Spirit to enable us. The Bible says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit enables them. So what does that mean for you and me? We must pray that the Holy Spirit would move on the hearts of those that we have identified, those whose names are secured to these crosses up here on the front, 
and believe God to intervene on their behalf. We need the the Holy Spirit to move upon them and enable them to see and confess the truth that Jesus is truly Lord. Amen? Final scripture here in this area comes from 1 John. It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray. Again, highlight those three words. He should pray. He's talking to believers on behalf of those that have not yet committed their lives to Jesus. What should we do on behalf of those? He said, we should pray that God would give them life. God's word simply instructs us to pray. Pray for those who are right now held bondage by sin. Not in a prideful way, or with some kind of arrogant attitude, but with the hope that God would bring them life. Now, I've been a Christian since 1985. For some of you, I I know it's, it's hard for you to believe. You thought I wasn't even that old, much less been a Christian that long. However, I've been a Christian since 1985. One of the things that the Lord has has really, I'm grateful for and gifted me with is the ability to remember what it was like without Jesus. Friend, I hope that you never forget the difference that Jesus made in your life. Of what it felt like to be lost and confused, having no destiny, no purpose, no understanding of eternity or the future. And the transformation that came when you confessed him, when you called on him to forgive you and to set you free from your past and to give you a future like Pastor Jason talked about today. Friend, there are people outside this building today in the neighborhoods around this church that need the hope of Jesus Christ. And I want to challenge you today that God would begin to move on your heart and to pray for them like we never have before. That it's worth being up a little later at night. It's worth getting up a little earlier in the morning to call on the name of the one who saved you and is able to save our lost family members and our lost loved ones and our, our, our lost co-workers. Jesus will do it if we'll ask him. Amen? I want you to watch this video of this testimony of powerful transformation of what God did in Chris Chris and Debbie's life. Watch this video. Every day that I lived, um, it was like I was living death. I didn't have any hope per day. It was waking up and smoking a joint and doing a line. A neighbor came to pick me up every day for church because she had told me, oh, I see that you don't have a car and I can drive you there. And I thought, okay, I'll go for service. Well, it so happened that she went to Sunday school. We were reading the book of Nehemiah and in the book of Nehemiah, it talked about how they were rebuilding the walls and about how they confessed their sins to one another and to God. As I was reading his word, he became so real to me. My marriage was a shambles and he wasn't even living with me anymore. If we didn't have drugs, we were fighting all the time. Our lives were horrible at our house. Um, It was, we were on and off, on and off, separated and back together, separated and back together. I thought if I could just, if I could just say out loud to somebody that um, I was a meth addict or that I um, couldn't get through my day without smoking marijuana, if I could just say it out loud and they wouldn't judge me, you know. And God, if you'll just, if you'll save my marriage, then I'll make sure that even if I'm not driven to church, then I'll take my kids to church. And I dropped to my knees because all I heard was God tell me to stop bargaining with him. I gave my entire life over to him. I finally confessed to him that it was my fault that I was on drugs. It wasn't my husband's fault. I knew without him even saying it out loud to me that he could forgive me. I knew that he could give me a brand new life. The first thing I wanted to do was go tell Chris that I was saved. He wasn't anywhere around. I'd been avoiding his phone calls. She came and called me one morning, or one afternoon I believe it was, and said, Chris, I found the Lord and uh, he's helping me through all this and he's changed my life. And I thought she was a freak. I thought, well, some people need that, but not me. I can, I can handle this on my own. Well, my husband, um, in the end, he started, he started coming to church just because he knew I was going to that church. I would sit in the church, and a lot of people there, but every word that was coming out of the pastor's 
mouth was directed right towards me. I felt like this guy's following me around. I know that God wants every single person to turn to him, but I thought Chris was done. I thought he was beyond help. I felt that I was unforgiven, that there was no forgiving me because I'd already crossed that line. And um, when I gave my heart to the Lord, when I went down that morning and I dumped all my stuff out to him, I stood up after that and I felt that I was truly, truly forgiven. I felt light. I, I felt like all this weight, the weight of sin, had, had fallen off my shoulders. Salvation is a free gift. It saved me, it saved my marriage, and we're just two people on the planet. Yeah. We're just two people on the planet. He did it for everybody. Amen. The power of the gospel brings hope, doesn't it? To think that the Lamb of God, he took the, the sins of the world upon himself and set us free. But did you notice the words of Debbie right at the beginning of that testimony? She said that her neighbor kept inviting her to church. Finally, she saw that she didn't have a car, she didn't have a way to get to church, and so her neighbor brought her to church. She gave her a ride to church. Friends, we need to activate ourselves in this process of bringing someone with you. It happened for Chris and Debbie. A miracle took place in their lives. God not only saved their soul, he healed their marriage and restored their lives completely. And he's not a respecter of persons. What he did for Chris and Debbie, he will do for you. He'll do for your neighbor. He'll do for the people you work with. He'll do for your family. We need to pray and intercede. It's important. Amen? The second thing that I want you to see today about intercession is the battle of prayer. When we intercede. When we intercede. That's the question. Praying for someone's salvation, listen to me, church, can often be a spiritual fight, a battle for the very souls of men and women. That's when we have to go to war in prayer on behalf of those that we have identified. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says these words, for we do not wrestle, and you should underline, circle that word wrestle in your outline, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's talking, as, when he uses that word wrestle, it, it, it denotes a conflict. There is a war, a battle that goes on. But he tells us that we shouldn't battle or war against people, against flesh and blood. But then he identifies the things that we should be wrestling against the things that we should be confronting, the things that we should be warring and battling against. Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Can I tell you this morning that our enemy, Satan, often will fight these battles by attempting to intimidate us into thinking that the situation's too great, that there's no hope for victory, so we quit before we ever really get started. He does this by influencing, listen to me, by influencing what we see, what we hear, and then what we think. Those are the three elements there in your outline of Satan's intimidation strategy. It's what we see, and then what we hear, and those strongly influence what we think. Now, there's a familiar Old Testament account of an event that illustrates this truth very, very clearly today. David, the shepherd boy, is going to war against Goliath, the mighty giant. And the first intimidation tactic of the enemy here is to try to get David to quit because of what he sees. What he sees, the appearance of the situation. In 1 Samuel 17, 4 and 5, the Bible says, a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. They tell us that six cubits and a span is a mere nine foot, nine inches. The dude was almost 10 foot tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels, which is about 125 pounds of bronze. Now, I weigh a slim trim 125 today, so you, oh, that's 225, I'm sorry, I was 120. So you can imagine then about how much this armor weighed that this giant was clad in. And so the appearance had to be intimidating. 
What David saw standing before him had to, had to intimidate him. In fact, in verse 24 of that same chapter, listen to what the Bible says, 1 Samuel 17, 24. So the men of Israel, when they saw, say saw, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. My friend, listen to me. Satan will come and by all our appearances, try to defeat you before you ever get started. He will try to make things look as if they're impossible. He'll try to make things appear that there's no way to get out of the situation that you're in. In fact, it had to be like Pee Wee Herman against the Incredible Hulk. I mean, by all appearances, that's what it had to look like. I was trying to think of some way that we could, you know, in reality, gather what, what, what was going on that day. And it must have been something like this, you know? Things appeared to be impossible. In Romans chapter 1, we're talking again about this process of salvation and praying for people through to salvation. In Romans 1.18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness for men. And listen to this last statement who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I want you to think about this. Have you ever prayed for somebody to get right with God, prayed for somebody to come to Jesus, and it got worse? I mean, it appeared that they even began to sin more <laughs> than what they were doing before. Guess what? That's good news. Did you hear the scripture? Do you know what that means? That means your prayers are making a difference. Because you see, what's happening is you're praying, the truth is coming up before them, and the only thing they know to do to suppress that truth, to push that truth away, is to sin more. Now, I don't know how it was for you, but when I got saved, friends, my most wicked days were the ones right before Jesus found me. My worst sin was just a few days before Jesus found me and ripped me out of the darkness. That's what the scripture says. Don't let what you see determine how you pray. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk. And when the Bible uses the, word, the term walk, it's talking about how we live every day, how we live out our lives every day. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Friends, if David would have let what he saw determine his actions, then we would not have 1 Samuel or King David in the Bible. Are you hearing me? If he would have let what he saw determine that, it would have kept him paralyzed. Don't be intimidated by what you see. I remember when I wasn't serving God away from the Lord, I uh, had a grandmother who just loved Jesus, and I knew that she prayed and sought God. She, when we would go to her house, if we were there on Sunday, we, we went to church, we just did. Um, my family was, didn't at that time, and so, um, but if we were at my grandma's house, we went to church. But I remember one weekend, I was at my grandmother's, away from God, turmoil just raging inside of me with all of the sin and the junk and the confusion that, uh, and the repercussions of sin in my life. And I was sitting on her couch and watching TV, and my, my grandmother, she's a crazy lady, but, um, <laughs> God, she went to be with Jesus uh, a year ago this past fall, but uh, I remember she had this coffee table in her front room, and it was an old, uh, I don't know where David Sopke is, remember those huge spools of telephone wire, you drive down the road, those big wooden spools, they had machines that went on them because they're so massive. She had taken one of those, turned it up on its end, and put a glass on top of it, and that was her coffee table. But I remember sitting on that couch, and that coffee table there in front of the couch, and big Bible open. Um, on that coffee table and inside that Bible was a tablet where she had written down some prayer requests and I remember seeing that tablet and she had a list there people that she was praying for and I saw my name and I was saying my name she had salvation she was praying for me to get saved she was praying for me to come to Jesus friends listen to me there were times when I was about to do things that horrible things and the Holy Spirit would bring a picture of that, that notepad back into my head. And I would remember, there's somebody praying for you, Davis. Get with the program. There's someone praying for you, Davis. You need to turn this thing around. You need to get right with God, Tim. Turn your life around. There's somebody praying for you. 
And I'm thankful today that up in heaven, Hebrews tells me that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I don't know how you interpret that scripture, and I'll leave that to you. That's fine. But, but this is how I think she can see us. And I think she's cheering on. Finish strong. Don't quit. It's worth it. Keep praying. Keep believing. God answered my prayer. He saved my grandson. He'll save your family members too. He'll do it. Don't stop praying no matter what you see going on. Amen? Hey, we got to hurry. Number two, the second intimidation tactic of the enemy is to try to get David to quit because of what he heard, because of the words that he heard. First Samuel 17, 10 and 11, Goliath said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul, listen to this, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were intimidated by the words of their enemy. Friends, listen to me. When we begin to pray and we begin to see God and we begin to go to war and fight for our loved ones and fight for the salvation of those that we care about, you can be sure that there's going to be things that you hear that will try to intimidate you and squelch your prayers. Be careful of people who always talk about the downside to everything. Friends, they have talked themselves out of God's promises. Be careful of those that it's raining on their parade no matter where they are. You know what I'm saying? Listen to me. Be positive. Don't play the what if game, the downward spiral. What if this happens and then that happens? And what if, friends, you can play the what if game the other direction too. What if my son gets saved? What if my, my daughter gets delivered, starts coming to church, sitting next to me and brings my grandkids with her and with their entire family and they serve Jesus the rest of their lives? Friends, the what if game works both directions. Play it right. The battle for the salvation of our family and friends is fought in prayer. That's when we fight. We don't fight them, we don't fight the person, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we love them. It's important to understand and pray this way because when we fight those things in prayer, we are promised victory in Jesus' name. See, if you're fighting the person, then it can go either way. But if you're fighting principalities, powers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, then friend, I can guarantee you victory not on the name of Tim Davis, but on the name of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He says, show me a scripture for that. Colossians chapter two, verses 13 through 15, look at this. When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Look at verse 15 right here. And having disarmed the powers and authorities. Having disarmed, having taken every weapon from the enemy, having made sure that no weapon formed against you is prospering, God has brought us the victory. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He's guaranteed us victory if we'll fight against the right thing and not against people. Number three, and finally, I wanna to talk to you today about the components of prayer, how to intercede. We've talked about all these philosophies. We've talked about why we should, how important it is. We've talked about um, you know, when, that we fight the right battle when we, when we uh, intercede. But we wanna make it real practical for you this morning. And these are the components of prayer. How to intercede. I've put um, a few of these um, in your outline there. And so you can take these with you. You can actually just write in the names of the people that you're praying for, that you've identified. And you can pray these specific scriptures over them, all right? Um, and so let's take a look, the components of prayer. Number one, pray that their mind will be open to the truth. When you're praying for the lost, you're praying salvation for someone, pray that their mind would be open to the truth. We know that, and, and again, I don't know how it was before you got saved, but we know that the enemy is, is a master of deception, right? I mean, that, he's been doing it since the Garden of Eden, right? He told Adam and Eve, did God really say not to eat of this tree, right? He's, he's a master of deception. Sin is born when we believe a lie. Sin is born when we believe a lie, when we take a lie 
and consider it truth. All right, simple enough, right? So what does the enemy do? He comes with what we see, what we hear, and tries to get us to believe a lie. Because if we'll believe a lie, then sin is born. And so it's important for us here to try to grasp a hold of this fact that God would open the eyes of the people that we love, that we care for, that we're witnessing to, that he would open their eyes to the truth. Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, and you know what I would do? Everywhere that there is an adjective there, or a pronoun rather, I would just put that person's name. You're not gonna do damage to the scriptures. Put their name right there. Whoever you're praying for, if you're praying for Susie or for Larry or whoever you're praying for, put their name right in there, all right? That the, I um, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of their understanding being enlightened that you may know, that they may know what is the hope of God's calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards those who believe, towards that person, according to the working of his mighty power? Isn't that cool? Man, if they would see that, friends, how could they deny such an incredible gospel truth? How could they deny and, and, and reject the hope of salvation in knowing truth? So when you're praying for somebody, pray that their mind will be open to truth. Secondly, when you're praying for someone, pray that they would recognize their need of the Savior. I'll be honest, this is a big one, especially in America in our culture, right? Because the truth is, everybody's a Christian and everybody's going to heaven. Just ask them, they'll tell you. <laughs> but, but that's not the truth. That would be convenient, that would be comfortable, and that would help us sleep better at night, but that's not what the Bible says. So that's not the truth. And so it is key for us to grasp a hold of this, that people, that we would pray that people would recognize their need of a savior. Friends, in this world, we are, it's like being on an airplane, you know? The Bible is clear, the, the, uh, the last condition of our earth, and it's not good. It's like being on an airplane that is heading for sure destruction. A, a, a definite crash. And so Jesus comes on the scene, God sends Jesus on the scene and says, listen, here's this parachute. Here's this way to make sure that the devastation of the last days, the judgment of sin, it, it, it does not come upon you. Here's this parachute to save your life. Put it on. And yet there are people on this airplane who don't understand that it's gonna crash, who don't understand that judgment is coming, who don't understand what eternity will bring. But it's important for us to pray and, uh, that they would have an understanding that they need a parachute, right? They need salvation. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, now I rejoice, now that you were made sorry, but by that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. You see, the point here is this, that, that, that when we um, are convicted, that, that it brings godly sorrow. And the Bible says that godly sorrow then brings repentance. See, if you never feel convicted about your sin, then you'll never see your need for the parachute or for the savior. And so it's important that people realize that there is a sin and a hell to be forgiven for and to escape, amen? And so we've got to pray that that exactly happens. I remember when um, the Lord poured out his Holy Spirit on me and, and rescued me from junk. I remember going forward and, and giving my heart to Jesus and it wasn't a cute little experience, you know? Um, I don't know how it was, and you gotta say that's how it was when I got, I mean, it was snotty, you know what I mean? I mean, it was just yucky, you know, and I, I'm crying, I'm weeping, you know, and I mean, it wasn't pretty, and you know, all my pot-smoking friends are there next to me, oh, Tim, it's gonna be okay, you know, pat my back. Finally, I just look at them and say, it's not okay, dude, we're going to hell. <laughs> That's not okay. But see, we have bought in, in this, this uh, culture that we're in, that, that somehow, some way that it's okay. Friend, it's not okay that your loved ones go to hell. It's not okay that your family members go to hell and we need to do something about it, amen? Begin to pray for them that they'll recognize their need of a savior. Now, the third prayer that you can pray is that you can pray that circumstances will arise in their life that will cause them to think about spiritual things. Spiritual things. And you know, I've noticed God uses all kinds of different stuff to do it. I've talked with parents who um, didn't have children and as soon as that wife uh, conceived, got pregnant, they begin to think, you know what? 
I didn't bring my family up in church. And God used this gift of a child to get them in church and to get them to the gospel. And they got saved and started coming to church and growing in the Lord and were radically, radically saved. And so God can use all kinds of different things. God can use actually the death of a loved one, the, uh, the loss of a loved one, all kinds of different circumstances to cause them to begin to think about spiritual things. Here are some of the questions that you might just pray that God would begin to, to um, cause them to pursue. How about who can I trust? It's a big one, right? What is truth? What is my purpose in life? Where will I go when I die? It's a big one. And how can I truly be free? These are things that we can begin to pray that those that we're, we're praying for will begin to ask themselves and to search the answers for because we know the answer, amen? Number four, pray that other believers would cross their path. This is a big one. In Luke chapter 10, verse two, the Bible says, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. We need to pray that God would cause other believers to cross their path. I remember when my family and I were praying for my brother to give his heart to Jesus and praying, I especially just felt a heavy burden because some of the habits and things that he was involved in, um, actually I introduced him to when I was away from God, and so I felt especially burdened for his salvation. But we began to pray that God would just bring other believers across his path. And I remember he graduated from college and um, started working in the Tulsa County Jail, and then he uh, actually got hired on as an Oklahoma Highway Patrolman, like the Indiana State Police here in, in our state. He began to work uh, there um, before he got his own patrol car, you know, and his own beat or whatever. Um, he had to work with a supervisor and ride around in his car with him. And so one day, uh, Rusty was telling me that he got in his patrol car his first days with the supervisor, you know, felt a little anxious, brand new job and everything. And so the supervisor's driving him through town, you know, and they're just uh, doing their normal thing as he's training. And they're driving down the road. And Rusty says that his supervisor pointed over to the right and says, now, this is, this is where I attend church um, each week. This is where I go to church. And Rusty looked over, and it's First Assembly of God. And Rusty looks at the guy and says, oh, you, um, you know, and this guy's already spent some time with Rusty, so he knows what's up. And he, lo he looks over at Rusty, and Rusty looks at him and says, oh, that's, that's interesting. My brother actually is a Assembly of God minister. He's a, a Assembly of God pastor. And the guy, there's just a pause, Rusty said, and the guy looked at him, and a smile came across his face, and he says, son, you've been set up. <laughs> you know what? We can set people up with our prayers. Pray that other believers would come across their path and that they would share Jesus with them, amen? Number five, pray for spiritual protection to be over that person. Write their name into that blank right there. Pray for spiritual protection over that person. Listen to, to, to Job. Um, and this is the enemy actually testifying of God's heads of protection around Job. Job 1.10, have you, God, not made a hedge around Job, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. You know what? We need to pray this protection, this hedge, around those that we're believing God for salvation for. I believe one of the reasons the rapture hasn't happened yet is because of the mercy of God to those who have yet to come in, that he's holding it off. I'll give you one more day. I'll give you one more week. Get it right. Come to me. I'm reaching out to you even now with the hope of the gospel. Amen. Friends, these prayers can be prayed anytime that you're praying for salvation. You can also have an intentional strategic time of prayer for those that you've identified. You can, I encourage you to pray at work, at school. Maybe you can set a lunch time aside to find a place where you can pray. It wouldn't hurt to fast sometimes. You know, the Bible says that fasting multiplies the power of our prayers, right? Because we are, we're humbling ourselves before the Lord. And the Bible says that God shows grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Fasting is a way to humiliate yourself without being humiliated. Do it. Fast and pray. So at school and at work, you can uh, put these prayers uh, to work. Also, I've heard of people doing prayer walks. You ever heard of a prayer walk? Especially if you're praying for your neighbors, you're inviting them to come to church. This is a great, great strategy. As you pray, uh, and um, you can walk through your neighborhood, pray specifically for your neighbors, that they would come to Jesus, and you can invite them to church, uh, especially Easter, invite them to Jesus Christ. It'll be a great, great time. Also, Pastor Wayne has put together this excellent uh, 
prayer book that people have been purchasing over at the Welcome Center. You can pick this up for about $5. Not only are these prayers that I uh, talked to you about today in here, but many, many more specifically about prayers that you can pray for the lost. And, and not just prayers that we think are good ideas or somehow of an imagination, but scriptures that literally challenge us and give us strategic ways to pray for the lost. And so I want to encourage you to pick up one of these on your way out over at the Welcome Center. It's just five bucks, tons and tons of uh, prayers that you can pray uh, that will help you, and especially as we're focusing on praying for the lost during these several weeks of bringing someone with you. How many of you, and I wanna close with this today, how many of you uh, were here a few weeks ago now, Mark Cahill is here, remember? Mark Cahill challenged us to, to pray Bob, pray for Bob, right? The first B was to pray for a burden for the lost. That O was to pray for an opportunity to share Jesus. And then lastly, that last B was to pray for the boldness to share Jesus Christ. Well, I, I, I've been doing that. I've been praying, Lord, you know, just give, give, give me, um, you know, the burden, give me an opportunity and, and, and give me boldness. Well, um, Friday night, I had the opportunity to I was over at, at Lakeview Church over on the west side there, and, um, was teaching ISOM, teaching Indiana School of Ministry uh, to about a little over 45 students there. And at the close of our time together, um, you know, I was hungry. It was about 10.30 at night. Ran through Burger King right there at Rockville and 465, Rockville Road 465, and then whipped around into my, my hotel. And the hotel parking lot was packed full, no parking spots, you know, that late. So it was packed. And so I had to park. I don't know if you know that area, but I had to park next door at Sam's Club. All right, so I park at Sam's Club and, and I'm walking and actually my telephone rang and, and uh, it was Angie, I was talking to Angie on the phone and I'm, I'm walking and talking to Angie and all of a sudden when I get to the road in between Sam's Club parking lot and the hotel parking lot, a car pulls up and stops right in front of me. Well, you know the neighborhood, so yeah, I was a little anxious, you know. <laughs> the door opens up and there's this precious lady inside, probably mid-50s, and she's crying, she says, I need your help. And so I hung up the phone, said, what, what, can, what can I do, ma'am? And she said, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get south, and um, my, my daughter called me, and one of my grandkids is really sick. I'm gonna have to take her to the mercy room. I'm just trying to get there to provide childcare for the rest of the family. I don't even know what's going on. She goes, but I've only been driving a few miles, and I was on 465, and, and the temperature gauge on my car uh, went up, and there's smoke coming up from my hood, and my car's overheating. She says, 11 o'clock at night. I don't know what to do. She goes, but when I got to this exit, I heard a voice say, if you'll exit here, I'll give you an opportunity to get this taken care of. And as soon as she said the word opportunity, I thought about Bob. <laughs> And I said, ma'am, I'm not sure if I can help you or not, but I know this, I've been praying for an opportunity like this one. And so we began to share and, and you know, popped her hood, looking at her car, and I am no mechanic. In fact, uh, because I'm a pro procrastinator, I'm a professional procrastinator, my toolbox from where I was doing some work here at the church several weeks ago uh, was still in my truck. And so I pulled out my toolbox, I opened it up, and there's my hammer and duct tape. Because if you can't fix it with a hammer and duct tape, it can't be fixed. <laughs> oh. I actually, praise God, it was just a, she had a hole in her, uh, the upper radiator hose, and it was right close to the clamp. She was able to take it off, cut the hose, boom, put it back on, fill her back up with water. She was ready to roll. Isn't that awesome? We got her car fixed, and I said, ma'am, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but do you go to church anywhere? Do you serve the Lord? Right away, she's just broken. She said, you know, I used to. This has been a long time. And I said, well, you know that voice you heard when you were driving down 465? And I think that was God. And he brought us together here. And I believe that we can pray together and you can get things back on track. And when Mary drove away, not only was her car not overheating, not only did she have a full tank of gas, but she took Jesus with her in a brand new life of serving Jesus. I believe the Lord has opportunities for us. We just gotta pray, guys. We gotta pray more. We gotta pray that God would give us a burden and opportunities and boldness, amen? Will you bow your head and close your eyes with me across this place? 
Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing even right now. I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would move in us in a great, great way. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts. Change us today, God. Help us to never, ever be the same again. This moment forward. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed across this room. I believe that there are people sitting in this room right now and you're like me, like I was. Your name is on somebody's prayer list somewhere, maybe sitting on their coffee table. And they're praying for you. And actually the fact that you're here today is just an answer to their prayers. But that answer is not complete yet. You see, God brought you here today to give you hope. God brought you here to set you free from your past and to give you peace about the future that he has for you. And so without belaboring the moment or extending this thing or embarrassing you in your way, if you're here today and you'd say, you know what, preacher? Today, I, I, I feel like Chris on the video. The things you've said, some of it, it was like, You've been following me around. I feel like you're talking to me today. Would you pray for me that I might know Jesus, that I might be ready for heaven, that I would leave this room today with the peace of God and the hope of everlasting life in heaven with Jesus forever? If that's you and you're here today, I'm gonna simply invite you to lift up your hand in just a moment and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you include me in that prayer? I wanna leave here knowing my destination in eternity. I want to leave here with the peace of God that passes all understanding. If you're here, would you lift up your hand right now and say, preacher, that's me. That's me. Hold it up real high. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. There are four people here that have lifted their hand and said that they need Jesus Christ. I want everybody in this room to pray this prayer with me, and they're going to pray it as well, and we're going to believe God. The reason we're praying it with them is we're going to let them know we're a family that we're not against them, we're for them. And we want to help them to walk out this relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me all over this room? Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today. Thank you for hearing my prayer, for bringing me to grace and bringing me to you. I ask you to forgive me of my past. Set me free from all bondages and come into my heart and help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you pray right now for those whose names are up here on this cross? Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray right now for Jason. I pray for Jimmy. Lord, I pray for Russ. I pray the eyes of their understanding would be open. Lord, they'd see their need of Jesus Christ as Savior. Lord, I pray, come on, church, help me out. Call out to the Lord. Lord, I pray for Hama. I pray for Josh. I pray for Erica. Lord, I lift them to you right now. I pray, God, that you'd bring other people across their path so that they would, would be able to share their faith with them and that they would know that there are others, Lord God, that are part of the kingdom of God. That, Lord God, you would deliver them from the deception from, of the enemy and that the power of the Holy Spirit would arrest them and capture them and draw them in by your love, oh God. Lord, may they see their need of Jesus and may they fall on their knees and confess him as Lord. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the four people who prayed that prayer today, oh God, and whose names are now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, the Bible says that all heaven is rejoicing, and so we rejoice with heaven in calling out to God and saying thank you. Lord, we believe that these next several weeks, including Easter weekend, is going to be a great time of harvest here at Grace. Lord, make it so. And everybody said in Jesus' name, praise God, amen. Put your hands together. Give the Lord praise for salvation today.